Good afternoon, everyone, or should I say good lunchtime? Uh, Eric is out today, as you know, so I'll be giving the guest lecture. My name is Chirong. Uh, I used to be a PhD student in the machine learning department at Carnegie Mellon. This was about, graduated about five years ago. Uh, right now, I work at a company called uh, Petrum. That's Eric's startup. I'm the co-founder as well as the CTO. So Eric and I have known each other for like 10 years now. And I've actually been giving this particular lecture quite a few times in the past. Uh, it's a lecture about how to take, uh, say, machine learning models into scale uh, using a variety of scalable algorithms as well as systems. In fact, this lecture was originally uh, in past years of this class, two separate lectures. Uh, I've only got one lecture now, so it'll be a little bit rushed, but uh, if you can't keep up with me, I'm available after the lecture to answer any questions you might have. Uh, so, on with it. So, essentially there are two challenges that we face when dealing with machine learning algorithms uh, in the real world. One is a very large data scale, which I, ca let's call that the theta bracket D, where D is data. So D can be very large. You may be familiar with this with, uh, say, if you've ever worked on any type of social media data, for instance, or any data that's publicly available on the web. The other type of challenge you have is a very large model size, uh, often hierarchical architectures such as Bayesian architectures, deep learning architectures, or even just uh, apparently simple looking models like regression can reach parameter sizes in the millions to billions these days. We denote that as uh, a large theta here. So theta bracket D where theta is large. And, uh, where do you see this happen? Well, one example I mentioned is already deep learning, uh, deep learning on, say, image and natural language processing data. Typically, typical model sizes are between about 100 million to a billion parameters these days for the state-of-the-art models. Uh, let's say you're doing a whole genome analysis, for instance. Uh, you're doing, you're, say, working in computational genetics. That's also the number of, uh, say, loci that you might examine might be between 10 million to 100 million, maybe even a billion. And there's plenty of other examples as well, so I won't go into say too much about all of them, but note that basically model parameters, sizes these days, can be up to a billion. What's a billion? You know, the representation for that, if you represent that as floating point, that's four gigabytes of memory minimum. And we'll see what, uh, what impact, you know, that kind of has. Okay, so ultimately, the goal of fast performance, getting fast performance in machine learning, is really about having your scalability be as close to the dotted line as possible. That's to say, as you increase the number of machines, your processing power or speed, the rate at which you make algorithmic iterations, should be as close to linear as possible. In practice, a well-implemented system will, uh, will be a little less than linear. That's represented by the blue line. There are always overheads that come in that prevent you from reaching the linear scalability. But what you really want to avoid is designing an algorithm or system that is the red line there where it plateaus after a certain amount. In fact, the red line is not the worst you can get. The worst you can get is actually you have a thousand machines and it performs worse than a single machine. The point is that it's very uh, easy, if you're not careful, to end up with what looks like a parallel or distributed algorithm running on many machines, but it's actually slower than a single machine. So the scope of uh, models and systems we'll cover today is a little bit broader than, uh, say, probabilistic graphical models alone. Uh, so as you all are aware, there, and I apologize if this is a bit hard to see, there are many models of machine learning, uh, uh, there are many families of machine learning models out there, you know, ranging from graphical models, which we're talking about, Bayesian models, of the non-parametric, the regularized kind, large margin models, structured regression, sparse coding, spectral matrix methods, deep learning methods, but all of them are supported by uh, a smaller number of algorithm optimization families, primarily Markov chain Monte Carlo and optimization algorithms, and as well as certain types of matrix and spectral methods. So we're gonna focus on the uh, two types today. One are the probabilistic programs that are formulated, for example, as a Bayesian program, or, some, or the other type, which is the optimization programs, which include, uh, say, different types of regression, as well as most deep learning models. So as, a, as a, probably a reminder that this is probably something that's familiar to everyone here, 
in order to understand the way distributed or parallel machine learning algorithms and systems behave, we focus primarily on the view that machine learning is going to be iterative convergent. You have a parameter state theta t, it's going to be updated by some delta f to get the state theta t plus one. And uh, basically all of the probabilistic programs and all of the optimization programs with maybe a very few minor exceptions fall into this view. Now, an important uh, kind of, say, preliminary concept to understand is that while most algorithms that you're taught in computer science require what we call operational correctness, that means that every operation must be perfect. There can't be any error or the output be wrong. Classic example is merge sort. If you make any error in any of these steps in merge sort, the final output will not be sorted. However, machine learning algorithms uh, because they are all formulated uh, primarily as a search over a uh, highly non-convex space to find a local optimum, they have this property that if you're looking for a hill, basically, or a valley inside the function, sp the function space, whether you start on the left side of the hill, the right side of the hill, you have guarantees that you're going to converge to the optimum, basically. So the point is that if you make a, if you do not have a perfect operation, instead of, say, following the, the path of steepest descent or whatever your algorithm is doing. You take a deviation to the left or right, the algorithm can still recover from that. And that's a very important property that is going to be uh, used repeatedly and exploited repeatedly in the design of parallel machine learning algorithms and systems. Okay, so uh, more formally, an ML program is basically an argmax, a search for the best parameters over a loss function which includes models, data, and of course the parameters of the model itself. You are taking an iterative convergent approach, so you're iterating over, say, some number of iterations, and there's a key step here, which is you're getting the new parameter state, theta t plus one, from theta t. Uh, usually there'll be a type of computation that uh, is a change, a delta. This is usually like Classic example is a gradient step, or another example for Markov chain Monte Carlo's, you're drawing new samples from it, and then you're aggregating it together with a function g. Typically, the computationally expensive part of the ML program is this piece, because you can see that it's both uh, scales in the size of data d, and also the number of parameters theta, since they're both inputs to this, and that's what we need to parallelize. Okay, so let's be a bit more concrete. Let's take a classic optimization program, such as, uh, say, uh, say, linear regression or lasso regression. You, you're trying to solve for basically some y equals x, uh, equals x times beta, where you know y, you know x, you're trying to solve for beta, basically. And here, the dimensions of the problem, n, the number of samples, m, the number of uh, coefficients inside beta, it could be, n could be very large, like it's not unusual to have a billion data samples these days in some of the larger scale problems. Like think if you were, for example, Facebook, and you needed to perform a regression over all of your users, you have about two billion users in the world, for instance. Similarly, the number of parameters m can be very, very large. Uh, the example I usually use here is if you're performing computational genomics, and you're trying to understand all of the single nucleotide polymorphisms inside the uh, human genome, or there are even creatures whose genome is like 10 times larger than the humans, for instance. Another type of program, probabilistic programs. Uh, here I'm motivating example with topic models, uh, latent originally allocation specifically, which I believe you all studied in this class. Um, here, instead of, uh, instead of doing a, say, a gradient descent or a second order descent algorithm, we are basically drawing samples uh, say doing, say, Gibbs sampling by drawing some of the variables given the probability distributions of the other variables in the model. Here we have potentially a large number of documents. Uh, let's say you're trying to analyze all of the news articles over the past 10 years, right? You might, and thanks to the fact that the internet has so many news sites, you might run to a billion of them. And then the number of words, now how many words are there in common use in the English vocabulary? It's about three million. Uh, 
it's going to be much higher if you start modeling uh, words that are essentially uh, proper nouns, like people's names, or say, uh, say if you even do something like distinguish, say, Barack Obama from Barack and Obama, and you treat those as three separate words. The point is that the scale of these can grow very large, and it manifests in the dimensions of the parameters growing very large. Okay, so uh, we're getting almost to the end of the preliminaries here. The other thing that you need to know, keep in mind across the lecture is that there are generally two basic parallelization strategies that are applied to uh, speeding up machine learning algorithms and building the systems that execute that. So they're called data parallel and model parallel respectively. And the intuition is fairly simple. In data parallel, you try to divide the computation along data indices. So if you have a billion data points and 100 machines, you send 10 million data points to each machine, you perform computations relevant to those 10 million, and you aggregate later. Model parallel is the opposite. Rather than trying to, uh, rather than trying to parallelize over data indices i, let's say we're going to parallelize over model indices, let's call that k. Right. And so we're splitting the computation by taking different parts of the parameter space looking at all the data and try to compute a local update or coordinate-wise update on those parameters. And of course, you can actually combine both data parallel and model parallel, such that each worker is looking at a subset of data and subset of parameters as well. Okay, uh, <clears throat> so now we get uh, properly into the first part of the lecture, which is about uh, different types of parallel optimization as well as, Markov, as well as Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms. So this is kind of the starting summary of the list that we'll cover. Uh, again, I apologize that I have to go a little fast because this is really two lectures in one. Uh, but like I said, if you have any detailed questions, stop me after the lecture. Okay. So um, let's go back to the first optimization example I showed, which is uh, sparse linear regression, uh, also known as lasso in its most basic form. You know, this fairly simple loss function here has a term that, let's call it the data fitting part. We're finding the beta, the parameters that fits best to the data y and x. And you have a variety of loss functions you can choose here. Squared loss, logistic loss, hinge loss, etc. You also have a regularization part, which induces a sparsity in beta. Sparsity is a desirable property uh, because it helps with the interpretability of the model and when used, uh, when used in a certain way, will also improve the uh, performance of the model and its robustness to, say, noise as well. And this is also a way to incorporate structured or domain information uh, into the model. You have certain types of knowledge about how the model should behave. And there's a, like the data fitting part, the regularization part is highly flexible. The lasso, uh, in lasso regression, that regularizer is simply the sum over the L1 of every coordinate uh, beta. And there's things like group lasso, tree lasso, overlapping lasso that are applied in different settings depending on the assumptions you want to incorporate into the problem. The point is that even the regression family, uh, the, the linear regression family, has, is actually a multiplicity of models where you basically pick a loss function and you pick a regularizer. Therefore, a parallel algorithm to solve these should be general purpose enough to actually deal with all the different combinations you can get. So how do we approach that? Well, let's first start with the most basic of uh, algorithms you can apply to a uh, regression or optimization problem. So that's going to be stochastic gradient descent. This is kind of, let's call it a building block towards the parallel algorithms that I'm going to describe. So consider any uh, generic optimization problem where you, can take the, uh, where you can take the first derivative, right? Let's call that function f. It's over some parameters x and some data d. Then the goal of uh, optimization here in classical gradient descent, you take the derivative, uh, you take the derivative of f, uh, which is a vector, and you do it over all the data, so you sum over all the data terms. That's because the loss function is additive over data, so therefore the gradient is also additive over data. In stochastic gradient descent, instead of doing the sum over all of the data points, you're going to pick one random sample, let's call it d sub i, and you're going to update the parameters based on that one sample, which is treat, it's a noisy approximation to true gradient. So rather than doing 1 over n, 
uh, times the sum over the gradient of overall samples. We do just um, the one over n factor disappears and we just take the single gradient. Now, this is an approximation, but it's been well understood in the literature that this converges uh, to a global optimum for convex problems. And typically, people don't use uh, the naive form in practice. What they actually use is the mini batch variation, where okay, you have a choice between one sample and n samples. How about I take 10 samples? How about I take 100 samples? So that helps, uh, that helps to reduce the variance in each of the iterations or steps because you're taking more samples and therefore your variance is going to be smaller. And then multiple samples, uh, that's multiple vectors. So you can actually apply uh, matrix computation techniques or even GPU computation techniques to speed it up further. So these are the practical it's basically a type of batching. So these are the, um, these are the types of, uh, in practice, mini batch stochastic gradient descent is used rather than single uh, SGD or a single point. Typical batch sizes and problems can range from a couple of tens all the way to a couple of ten thousands, depending on the type of problem you're solving. Now, that, so that leads us to our very first uh, parallel algorithm, which is maybe the simplest possible one you can imagine. You know, using the intuition that if you have a mini batch SGD, you're going to need to compute the gradient uh, for every single data point uh, inside the mini batch. So why not just split the data points across different uh, parallel workers or machines, have them all compute, update the local copy of their parameters, and then aggregate after that. So basically what everyone is doing is, okay, let's take some data samples. Let's say you take 1 to 100, I take 101 to 200. I'm going to compute the update to beta. I'm going to actually update beta over there. Then I'm going to aggregate the, the betas from each machine in some way. Maybe I'm going to average them. So uh, basically that boils down to SGD or local copy of parameters at each machine. Uh, in fact, what is not obvious here is that in the original formulation in this paper, all of these machines uh, never talk to each other. They just wait until SGD totally converges, and right at the end, when they've all hit their local, different local optima, they aggregate in some way. Now, um, obviously, this has some deficiencies, like what happens if machine one goes into a local optima to the left, what happens if machine two goes into a local optima to the right, you try to average. The average of those two is not a local optima anymore. In fact, it might, be, it might actually be a peak or something like that. So this algorithm, while, uh, while simple and requires almost no communication between the machines, has some fundamental flaws in practice. So what about another algorithm? Uh, let's take a look at another way to do this that's a bit more sophisticated. Now, in many, uh, in many cases, you'll find that the data, when you're dealing with big data, the data may be sparse. Uh, for example, uh, if I have a, um, a good example here is matrix completion problems. Uh, recall the classical uh, Netflix challenge where you're supposed to figure out for all of the users on Netflix what are the movies they'll like. And you only have partial information about this. Not everyone tells you all the movies they could possibly like. So the matrix is sparse. It's highly sparse, so that means uh, most of the entries are actually just empty zeros. Now, if you have a sparse problem, one way to think about it is to split the loss function f uh, into a sum of functions uh, where the index e is actually a subset of parameter indices. So basically, it's like finding the, the, the pockets of density inside the entire sparse function. Uh, for example, let's say, um, let's say this is a Netflix challenge. There's a couple of comedy movies I like, there's a couple of horror movies someone else, is like, someone else likes, and you know these tend to be clustered together. Then what you can do is that you can define maybe little e sub 1 to be the set of comedy movies and little e sub 2 to be the set of horror movies. And the idea, and just to finish all the notation here, you know, f is the loss function uh, on the subset e, and x is the parameter values uh, that are only indexed by e. So that's the parameters that are relevant to horror or comedy, or etc. So it turns out that the cost functions of many ML problems can be represented this way, provided the input data is sparse. And in some ML problems, the uh, function itself is sparse, so you might have a very large number of, uh, say, movies. Maybe there's one million movies in the world. And the number of users on Netflix is large, hundreds of millions of users. But every time you are looking at these subsets E, it's only a small number of movies, maybe 10, maybe 20, maybe 30. 
So, many, as I was saying, many problems, spot vector machines, matrix completion, graph cuts, often run into sparse data that uh, enables this approach called Hogwall uh, to work on them. So I'm not going to go too deep into the equations here, but what it basically means is in sparse SVM, your X, your X input matrix is sparse. In matrix completion, you're trying to take a matrix and complete it, it's also sparse. Graph cuts, if you take a graph or network and represent it as an adjacency matrix, that is also sparse. Okay, so uh, on to the actual algorithm. So the Hogwild algorithm, and you'll see why it's called Hogwild in a minute, does this. Let's say I have each uh, core or each worker or each parallel worker in, in a system. For, I'm going to allow all of these guys to run in parallel uh, without even uh, necessarily talking to each other. And then what they're going to do is that each of them will pick a subset little e from the big set e. Right? So maybe I'll pick horror movies, another core picks uh, comedy movies. It's going to read the parameters that are relevant to the subset little e they picked up. So I'm say going to pick up the uh, X for all the horror movies and the other guy picks up the X for all the comedy movies. And then we're going to sample uniformly at random one coordinate from this subset. So maybe I will go for uh, Miss Congeniality or some other movie and the other guy goes for some Friday the 13th. Then perform SGD on the coordinate so that means I'm going to pick some, some data samples, not all the data, just some mini batch of it, and I'll update it with a small constant step size. But the cool part about this algorithm is that uh, what happens is that because all the coordinates uh, are due to the sparsity of the problem, the odds that there'll be a collision. Uh, so although I gave the kind of uh, contrived example that I'm doing horror movies and you're doing comedy movies or the other way around, what happens if there's a horror and comedy movie, a movie that's horror comedy? And then what happens if we both uh, pick it and then try to update the same coordinate at the same time? So what happens is that due to the sparsity, you can prove that because the chance of this collision happening is very, very low, the chance that we'll both pick the same coordinate to update, you can, uh, you can prove that this will actually still converge. And from a implementation computer science perspective, you actually use something called atomic uh, memory updates to avoid, uh, to, av to reduce the overhead of uh, the algorithm as far as possible. So that's not something that I'll go into too deep, but just know that these are some of the systems techniques that were used to make this possible. So what actually happens is that this algorithm, and that's why it's called Hogwild, everyone is running uh, and updating their own coordinates, and we don't care if we collide or not on the same coordinate because the chance of that happening is very low if the problem is sparse. So the performance of this algorithm is actually excellent on a single machine, but these days a single machine with 8 or 16 cores is not enough to solve some of the biggest problems we've got. Usually you have to go up to a cluster of machines to get something like, say, training a very large deep network like, say, VGG16 on, a, uh, on the ImageNet data. That takes at least days on a single machine. You want to get that down to hours on a distributed cluster. However, Hogwarts doesn't work well in a distributed setting, and there's a very important reason. So this is another important intuition that I want to impress. The delay among machines, when you have machines that are connected, say, via a local aerial network, is much higher than the delay between the CPU and its memory. Hogwarts relies on the fact that CPU to memory communication is very fast, but in a distributed system, that's, say, multiple physical machines, communication over the network is very slow. Why is that a problem? So there's a little bit of theory behind this. You don't need to stare too hard at the, uh, the, the theorem over there. But what you need to pay attention to is that this theorem basically talks about the rate of convergence for a parallel algorithm, say like a SGD, running in a distributed system. This, look at this term here, this term that I'm calling uh, epsilon. So basically this is a term that's exponential 1 over epsilon. Epsilon is the mean, uh, epsilon m and epsilon v uh, represent the mean and variance of the delay in the system. So for example, what's delay? If it takes me, say, uh, five milliseconds to talk to the next computer, that delay is five milliseconds, essentially, right? Or if it takes me, say, 100 milliseconds to talk to a computer over in Japan, well, that's 100 milliseconds delay. The point is that there is a penalty that grows, uh, the convergence that grows with exponential one over this delay, and the Therefore, 
in a distributed system where this delay is much higher, CPU to memory communication is, I think, usually measured in nanoseconds or lower. It's like a thousand orders or 10,000, maybe 100,000 orders of magnitude faster than network communication. That high delay in network communication actually hurts the convergence tremendously of these algorithms. And the fact is distributed systems have a high delay. So these types of algorithms that were optimized for single machine uh, in memory computation do not work so well in the distributed setting. Okay. There's some further theory around this. I won't go into it, but this basically talks about the variance analysis. It's not just that the mean impact is high, the variance also has a tremendous impact, as you might uh, have that intuition if you've ever studied any type of uh, the convergence or any type of algorithm, that the more noise you have in the system, the slower it's going to converge. Okay, so that leads to a more a different type of technique that is used in the distributed setting. It's what we call a key value store or parameter server. Uh, this paradigm has actually become uh, dominant over the past uh, five or ten years. So parameter server systems are found in almost every uh, popular open source package uh, out there. And the idea is you have some machines whose jo only job is to store the parameters and receive updates from other machines and every other machine is a worker that's computing gradient and sending the gradient updates to the machines. So there's now a division of labor. Instead of every machine trying to update parameters and compute gradients at the same time, some are computing gradients, some are computing parameters. So the most naive way to do this is to adopt what we call the bulk synchronous parallel scheme. That's the scheme used in systems like classical big data systems like Hadoop, like Spark. Uh, what does bulk synchronous parallel actually mean? That means at iteration t, okay, I have say 10 workers and 100 million data points. Everyone computes the gradient on 10 million data points, sends the aggregated gradient to the parameter server, which then, uh, which then waits to do its addition, and then sends the updated value back to all the workers at the same time. All the workers wait for the parameter server to do this. However, there are if you do this and the delay is, say, measured in, say, 5 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, that's a cost that adds up very quickly. So what you want to do is instead of adopting a bulk synchronous parallel uh, model, you're going to do what is called asynchronous or stale synchronous parallel, which is a form of communication where you don't necessarily wait for everyone to finish their job. You can move ahead, slightly ahead, not too far ahead. And that's actually similar to the idea in Hogwild, but where Hogwild doesn't put any limits on how far ahead you could run or how many times you can step on someone else's toes by updating the same coordinate, the uh, stale synchronous model and parallel model in particular mandates that, okay, you can go a little further ahead, we give you some flexibility, but we're not going to allow you to run too far ahead of other people. What does this mean in practice? So what, what this actually means is that every worker may see a copy of the master parameters that could be completely up to date, or it could be up to, say, S iterations old, because instead of waiting for the reply from the parameter server, it's going ahead with my last known value of the parameters. So this is, what is, uh, this is basically a form of bounded asynchronous parallelism, where you are allowing workers to proceed with out-of-date copies of the parameter, but rather than uh, letting this be unlimited, again, you're bounding it to window S. So, this is something that we'll explain a little bit more in detail towards the end of the lecture. For now, just be aware that uh, there's something called a synchronization model and that it matters for distributed parallel algorithms. So uh, to be a little more concrete, if you have a parameter key value, server or key value store, and let's say we're taking our running example of lasso regression, the first thing you do is, let's say you have one parameter server and 10 workers, you put the beta, the coefficients, inside the parameter server. Every worker is going to draw a subset of the data samples at, like I said, 100 million samples. Everyone gets 10 million there. You compute the gradient for each term in the loss function with respect to all the parameters beta. So this is a data parallel algorithm. We're splitting over the data, but not over the parameters. We update beta with a gradient. And then we may perform, uh, say, a, uh, to solve for the regularizer, it's common to use something that we call a proximal operator, uh, which is essentially is a kind of projection. And then we pass the gradients 
to the server, and the server computes the proximal operator. So the bounded asynchronous synchronization in this case uh, ensures that instead of waiting for the latest value of beta, you can say do fast, you can go ahead, let's say it takes uh, for some reason one second for the reply to come back for the server, but you can do 10 iterations per second. Then instead of waiting for the server, let's go ahead and do 10 iterations first, and then when the new value of beta comes in, we'll update there. The point of doing something as seemingly complicated as that is that you get much faster and better convergence when you allow uh, what we call this bounded asynchronous parallel. And what happens here is that if you take a look at, say, a, a typical, uh, this, in this case, this is topic modeling. If you take a look at bulk synchronous parallels performance, uh, it has this convergence curve in blue here. Allowing it to be run in a, say, a Hogwarts style fashion, completely asynchronous, pushes it to the green curve here. So you are reaching a higher objective value in less time. And then if you are allowing a, putting a bound on the amount of asynchrony that can happen, here that's still 32, that's 32 iterations worth of, you can go as far as 32 iterations ahead before you need to get the values of the, uh, the topic parameters, for instance. And you can improve that even further, for instance. So the point is that these things matter, and you think about what it actually means. Uh, let's, let's draw a horizontal line here for this particle log likelihood. You'll see that in this particle example, the still system uh, reached the same objective value in about half the time that the uh, bulk synchronous parallel system did. And in some cases, this is actually as dramatic as uh, one-tenth the time or more. So despite the fact that this seems to be all a little complicated, it's worth knowing about because it has a huge impact in practice. So uh, we've talked a lot about, say, the stochastic gradient uh, descent family of algorithms and how it can be run in a Hogwarts asynchronous mode, how it can be run with a parameter server that's running in bulk synchronous parallel or what we call bounded asynchronous parallel. The next algorithm we're going to talk about is the coordinate descent algorithm. Uh, which, as its name suggests, this is an algorithm that's amenable to model parallelism rather than data parallelism. Instead of splitting over data samples, you're going to split over coordinates. So, take Lasso again. The way you perform coordinate descent is pick some coordinate j in beta. So let's say beta is, say, 1 million dimensions. I'm going to pick some j between 1 to 1 million. And then I'm going to just solve this particular equation, which is just the indices in J, set the subgradient to zero because this is a regularized problem. And then, you know, derive basically an op update rule that looks like this. I'm not going to go into the math, but this is an equation that's commonly taught in other classes. There is a generalization of uh, coordinate descent that we call block coordinate descent. So uh, as its name suggests, rather than picking one coordinate J, Let's pick a number of them. Let's call it 10 coordinates, 100 coordinates. And I'm going to simultaneously solve the system of equations over all uh, j coordinates in the set g I picked. So rather than solving uh, this you know, one equation for, say, j equals 1, I'm going to solve it for j equals 1 to 100 simultaneously. And that gives you a block update. Uh, so in general, this has better convergence per iteration, but it's costly because now you're solving a uh, a system of equations that's eventually essentially solving a linear algebra problem. Okay, so with those preliminaries out of the way, you now know uh, basically what single coordinate descent is and what block coordinate descent is. We now talk about how do we parallelize this. Uh, so the first paper that actually attempted to do this uh, back in 2011 was an algorithm called Shotgun, and it has similarities with Hogwild, right? It basically, um, it basically, uh, is a, uh, well, okay, it's similar to Hogwild in that it's a very naive but simple algorithm that can be easily implemented. And although the difference with Hogwild is that where Hogwild allows every worker to run at full speed, Shotgun isn't doing that. The name Shotgun comes from the fact that it's literally picking coordinates at random. So if I have 10 workers, everybody's going to pick a coordinate. And we're going to pick this without worrying about the model structure, without worrying about the data structure at all. We're just going to pick and pray. So uh, this sounds dangerous, but it turns out that there is a term that you can uh, compute, which is uh, rho, the spectral radius of A transpose A, where A is the uh, data matrix. So by basically looking at uh, the essentially 
what A transpose A is actually the covariance matrix of the data, right? Take the data matrix and then compute its covariance. If you computing the spectral radius of it essentially gives you an idea into how much correlation there is between different coordinates inside the system. In practice, you never compute that because you have to using big data. But the point is that if you know your problem is, for example, sparse, highly sparse, or you know that it's mostly uncorrelated, then this algorithm actually works very well. However, the counterexample is that what happens if every feature is perfectly correlated with every other feature? What happens is that, let's say I have a single, my problem actually is only one column of data, and I duplicate that 100 times, right? So it's all perfectly correlated. If you try to run this type of shotgun algorithm on it, what will happen is that your convergence rate, in terms of the amount of work you did, is actually no better than single machine. And the reason is that all the features are perfectly correlated. So what happens is that when every machine performs a step, they're literally all stepping on each other's toes, they're all performing redundant work and don't proceed. So that's a little bit of uh, intuition going to this problem. Uh, so in fact, what I just said is illustrated in these graphs here. When you have an uncorrelated problem, let's say it's a two-dimensional problem, if it's uncorrelated, your data looks like this. There's no correlation between the x and y. When you try to, uh, say, take a two coordinate steps, one for each worker, you make this step and you make this step here. So when you add both of them, you get this vector here and you get kind of make good progress towards the optimum. But when the data is very correlated, what happens is that when you add the two coordinate steps together, they're also correlated and that has a tendency to essentially overshoot or basically Basically, what happens is that whatever step size you choose uh, is wrong because of all, all the correlation. And that, in practice, can slow down this algorithm a lot. So although it's, this algorithm is naive and super easy to implement, uh, just like all the naive algorithms I talked about earlier, you'd want to be a little more sophisticated in how you do this to deal with uh, some of the realities of model structure and data structure. So. Um, that leads to the second algorithm, which is what we call block greedy coordinate descent. So this is a generalization of shotgun, right? Just like block coordinate descent is a generalization of CD, this one generalizes shotgun. So instead of picking all the coordinates at random for every worker, what we're going to do is we're going to divide the uh, input space, the parameter space. Let's say I have 100 parameters. I'm going to divide that into capital B blocks. Maybe every block, maybe I'll have 10 blocks. The blocks don't need to be the same size, but what matters is that the way the blocks are chosen is such that they're uncorrelated. For example, if I know that coordinates 1 to 10 are about, again, let's use my Netflix example, horror movies, and coordinates 11 to 20 are about comedy movies, then I would expect there to be kind of less correlation between these two groups than if I were to pick, say, movie 1 and movie 2, which are both horror movies, for instance. So given that we have some way of partitioning the matrix into different blocks, or rather the coordinate space into different blocks. Then what happens is that we're going to pick up some random number of blocks, assign them to different workers. The point is every worker has got to get a different block. They can't be on the same block. Then within each block, every worker picks a coordinate, which is equivalent to picking, say, a specific movie, and they update the coordinate. So uh, you may already get why this is a good thing, because by first partitioning by blocks, and then by letting every worker operate on the individual coordinates, you are essentially avoiding a situation where two workers are picking coordinates that are correlated. You already dealt with that during the block partitioning stage. So this has uh, good convergence properties, sublinear, one over k. Um, and the, but again, it's kind of dependent on whether or not you can find a partitioning. And that's actually the weakness of this method, because if you already knew the, co the, the correlation, you must have computed something like A transpose A, which is the covariance matrix. That in itself is so expensive to compute that this algorithm is actually uh, impractical except in special situations. So fundamentally good idea but requires you to know uh, the correlation between coordinates, which is impossible to compute in practice. Okay, so does that mean that it's completely hopeless, right? I want to know the correlation between parameters so that I can, uh, I can be efficient about this, but it's expensive to compute. So is there a better way to go about this? So that leads to a uh, discussion of another paper that is about using a dynamic scheduler system. So the difference is that the past two algorithms uh, say uh, a shotgun as well as a, a parallel block greedy coordinate descent, 
relied on simple, let's call them static schedules. The schedules are not influenced by the runtime of the algorithm. They are just a simple random strategy at every, every iteration. What if we were able to use the information about how the algorithm is behaving during runtime to influence the choice of the coordinates? Right. And the way this uh, paper does it is that there's two ways, two ideas it uses. One is to do a uh, dependency check at runtime rather than at the start of the algorithm. So we push the, 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 comp the check of whether two things are correlated to the point it's needed. So in computer science, that's basically being lazy rather than eager about your evaluation. The second is that you don't actually have to update every coordinate the same number of times. You can prioritize. For example, if you know that, say, coordinate one is much further from convergence than coordinate two, then it makes more sense to take more iterations on coordinate one. There's nothing to say that you have to do it one by one. You could do 10 times on coordinate one. You could do one time on coordinate two. So, so, during prior, so how does this actually work? So the prioritization step where we're basically saying which coordinate should get more computational attention. We basically select that according to the historic rate of change of the parameter, right? So if the rate of change of the parameter is still very fast, that's a good hint that it's far from convergence. In fact, this is especially good for lasso type problems because if some, once one the parameter hits zero, it's fairly unlikely it will become non-zero again. It could, but it's highly unlikely, and therefore its rate of change is zero for the previous iteration. And then for dependency check, uh, basically we, what, what we do is that we locally compute for two coordinates, k and j, their inner product. That's basically whether they're correlated or not with each other. So don't do it on the whole matrix, just do it on two coordinates at the same time because the whole matrix is expensive. And then if these two coordinates are highly correlated, then we, don't, we choose not to schedule J and K at the same time. We say, okay, K's got to come after J, J's got to come after K, doesn't matter which way, don't do that at the same time. So just apply these two rules here, pick coordinates that have high rate of change, don't schedule two coordinates together if they, are, if they have high correlation. Oops, um, let me go back there. And then you just perform the coordinate-wise, uh, say, uh, coordinate descent algorithm in parallel of the, over different workers. The idea is that there's a master scheduler that does all these computations, makes, does the thinking, and then says, okay, for you 10 guys, you get coordinate one, you get coordinate five, you get coordinate 10. I've done all the thinking about what to do. The impact of this is actually even more dramatic than, say, staleness uh, in uh, stochastic gradient descent. What happens is that a naive shotgun algorithm converges like this, and a priority-based algorithm converges. Um, it's not even a curve that you normally see in convergence analysis. This is actually the impact of prioritization combined with uh, dependency checking. So it can dramatically speed uh, convergence up by order of 10 or more just by doing these strategies. So the point is that spending a little effort to understand the structure of the problem and coming up with strategy uh, it means a huge difference. It means your experiment is completing in one day instead of one week, or one hour instead of one day. That's the motivation to do this. Okay. Uh, now the third part of uh, the third and final category of optimization algorithms that uh, I'll briefly cover are the class that's known as, say, uh, proximal algorithms. And the reason for covering this is that uh, stochast um, so for example, and that should have been SGD, I'm sorry. So what if the simple methods like stochastic gradient descent and CD are not adequate? Where they're not adequate? For something like lasso, we can derive a closed form subgradient to solve for it. But what happens if your regularizer is like really complicated? Or uh, then or what if it's not even a regularizer? What if it's actually a constraint? Like I got to keep my optimization within a circle, or got to keep my optimization within a certain box. How do you deal with these things? Well, the way to handle it is with um, different types of algorithms. We'll focus on what's called the PG or proximal gradient family of algorithms. And so these algorithms are a little bit more complicated than SGD or CD. And again, you've got to understand some of the uh, basic math behind it before we can parallelize it. Okay, so the, uh, the setting here, and I'll go a little more slowly here as so this is a bit more involved, is that you have a loss function, that f, and a regularizer, or, well, let's not even call it a regularizer, let's call it a non-differentiable function, g. So f will be, we assume it's going to be smooth and differentiable, you can get the gradient. g, it's going to be uh, non-differentiable for sure, 
and it might not even be possible to get a subgradient out of it easily. So the intuition behind proximal gradient is that there is an algorithm uh, called projected gradient, which is, has historically been used to solve constraint optimization problems. What's a constraint optimization problem? Instead of being able to search over the whole real line, I have to keep it between minus one and one, for instance. So the way you handle constraint optimization problems is to compute a gradient step, that's the first line, and then you do a projection, uh, a, least, a projection of a least squares loss into the space, constraint space, such that you cannot be outside the constraint, but you pick the point in the constraint space that's as close as possible to the gradient step you just took. So what happens is that if you take a step and you're still inside the constraint box, you're good, nothing happens. If you take a step and you fall outside the box, it's going to find the nearest point on the box to the point where you were and project you back there and keep you in bounds. So this simple algorithm uh, is guaranteed to converge with a certain rate, and the generalization of that is the proximal gradient, where instead of taking the projection of the uh, point where you're at to the constraint space, you perform something that's called a proximal map. Uh, proximal map, if the, if the G is just the constraint, then it reduces back to projected gradient, but G could be something like an L1 norm, so you have lasso. So essentially, proximal gradient is a generalization of both like lasso subgradient as well as projected gradient for constraints. So it's a very generic workhorse algorithm. It's worth learning about. So um, there's some um, history about it that I won't go too much into, but very roughly, the practicality of proximal gradient depends on you having a closed form for the what's called a proximal map of G. Because the algorithm proceeds by taking a gradient step on F, which is easy, and then you have to do this uh, mysterious looking proximal map on G, what happens is that just like calculus, we don't do first principles derivation for calculus every day. We don't derive the chain rule every day, for instance. So for the proximal gradient literature, has essentially cheat sheets. For every G out there, commonly used G, people have derived a closed form of the proximal map P sub G. So this, what this means is that from an implementer's perspective, this is actually super easy. You just need to implement for the lookup you know, online for the G you need, and then go find a map and go implement it. So despite the fact it looks intimidating, it's actually very practical. And then there are ways to deal with uh, additional G. Like what happens if I have two, two Gs, like one is a L1 loss and the other is a box constraint? Well, it's actually super simple. You just apply the proximal maps in sequence to each other. So you do a gradient, and you do however many proximal maps there are. You're done. That's one iteration. OK, having said that, there are some improvements that I need to talk about first before I get into the parallelization part. So uh, one easy improvement to proximal gradient is called accelerated proximal gradient, where the first step is the same. You compute the gradient. The second step is the same. You do the proximal map function. And the third step, what happens is that you're going to add a momentum term. And momentum is basically okay, where, were I, where was I for the last iteration? And then, so let's say I've moved, uh, say, uh, say, five units in a certain direction. Then I'm going to actually add that momentum on to my current state. So that, that means that it's kind of like, you know, slipping on ice. You've got to move a little further. But the key is that uh, there's going to be a schedule here that uh, eventually... Um, starts off, uh, starts off uh, very small, and then, uh, let's see, if I'm reading this right, yeah, as t goes to infinity, this basically goes to one, basically. But when t is, uh, say, small, like one, there's no momentum. So the momentum speeds up after a few steps. It turns out that this simple addition, basically slipping on ice, as I call it, uh, does improve the convergence from one over t to one over t square. So it's such a simple addition that everyone does it because it just uh, produces better convergence rate overall. Okay. So now using that as a basis, accelerated proximal gradient, gradient step, uh, proximal map followed by momentum term. How do you parallelize this? It turns out it's uh, actually not difficult to do. You just need a parameter server architecture or key value store architecture. You compute the gradients. Let's say you have 10 workers. Compute the gradients on 10 workers. Take the gradient step. Aggregate the gradients back to the servers and let the server, parameter server, compute the proximal operator, the proximal map, and the momentum term, right? So do the hard part, which is there's a ton of data out there, send it off to everyone, let them compute all those expensive gradients, and do the easier parts on the server. And 
just repeat that. So it's a very simple algorithm. It works with a bulk synchronous parallel strategy. That's one where everyone is waiting patiently for the server to complete. It could also work in an asynchronous setting, but it's not been well analyzed. What happens if you uh, decide to let workers run ahead without letting the server talk back to them? Because here, unlike stochastic gradient descent, you have this proximal operator, you have this momentum term. This is not to my knowledge, well studied as of today. You can try it and it's probably going to, in a number of cases, perform better than bulk synchronous parallel, but you need to be careful because no one's actually done the theoretical analysis yet. Okay, uh, I'm going to gloss over this part quickly as it's not so important, but essentially there's a uh, even further extension to proximal gradient that allows you to deal with F that is not actually Lipschitz continuous. So that means what if your F is not say like squared loss, but it's actually, uh, it's actually like uh, the uh, L1 loss function itself. So it looks like this triangle. Then, you, then usually what you do is you take subgradients to do it, but how can we fit this back into the proximal gradient setting? Uh, the, um, without going to the details, the, the spoiler as it were, is that you can replace the entire gradient step with a proximal operator. So this algorithm literally becomes nothing but proximal operators. You apply a proximal operator for what's called a uh, borrow envelope function on F, and then the whole thing reduces to just apply nothing but proximal operators in sequence again and again and again. So it's kind of like a fixed point algorithm. So this is usually used to deal with non-smooth F. In practice, most of you probably won't run into that. There, uh, the, the small note remark I'll make is that trying to do parallel smoothing proximal gradient is a bit tricky. Because everything has been replaced by proximal operators, you no longer compute gradients, uh, then there's, it's not obvious where the opportunity to parallelize is. So you actually need to look at the structure of the proximal operator itself. You need to see if the operator itself can be parallelized by sending the work to workers. So that's just kind of the uh, remark I'm going to make. But otherwise, uh, I'm going to just gloss over this. Okay, uh, it's now 12.53. We've got about 25 minutes in the lecture. So I'm going to go a little faster in this section. Um, some of it you can read on your own, but I'm just going to give you the high level details as there's a third section I need to cover. So for M if you're doing MCMC or you're doing say Bayesian models, any type of probabilistic models, uh, most likely you will have a uh, objective function that's basically the log likelihood function as above. And if you're familiar with topic modeling, I introduced it a little earlier, you're trying to essentially take a, a piece of unstructured text, like a news article, and basically find all the different, uh, what we call topics, which are actually distributions over different words in the vocabulary that are present inside that uh, topic model. So there are two general ways of dealing with probabilistic programs. Uh, one is Markov chain Monte Carlo, which I already mentioned. The other type of algorithm is actually to approximate the problem with what we call stochastic variational inference, which is an uh, optimization-based uh, technique. Uh, and then there's actually combinations of MCMC and SVI that's performed as well. So uh, I'm going to skip over this, not really necessary. Uh, what you need to know as preliminaries or background to understand this is that the most classical MCMC solution, the one that's been done by statisticians and physicists for many decades, is to just run multiple chains in parallel. So you let every machine do the Gibbs sampling or whatever your favorite MCMC algorithm, Metropolis Hastings is. You run them all in parallel, and then you kind of average a consensus between the different chains. The problem is that this worked for simpler models, but for more complex models that we tend to deal with in like this PGM class, the chains will all be kind of very different from each other. Trying to aggregate them may not be meaningful. In fact, it may not even have converged anyway. And there's basically no, and you need the full data set on every machine. So it's also very slow for a number of reasons. So the most naive method is to take multiple chains and aggregate but this, it, this doesn't actually improve the speed of convergence of those chains. It just gives you more samples at convergence. What we actually want is to converge to the steady state faster. Uh, solution two is what's uh, classic solution to sequential importance sampling. Uh, this essentially says, okay, I'm gonna take my distribution and I'm gonna be very smart about factorizing it. I'm gonna write it as a telescoping sum and I'm gonna draw samples sequentially uh, over um, over, uh, say, if I have n, so when I say sequentially, I mean that if I have uh, 
I really shouldn't have used n. Let's say I have k variables, right? Because n is usually the number of data points we have. Let's say I have k variables, then I'm going to uh, essentially sample every one at a time. So it's kind of like Gibbs sampling in the sense that it's sequential, but it's in a particular order. So I'm not going to go too far into it, but you just know that this is a classic method that was used. So some of the modern methods that are used to parallelize or speed up uh, uh, probabilistic problems. One is to simply rewrite the model in a way that is amenable to sampling, right? So it's, it's not changing the distribution, it's simply being uh, rewriting the distribution in a way that the, it's still equivalent to the first one, but it has a different parameterization as a different set of variables. So uh, uh, one particular technique that has been used is what we call auxiliary variables. So let's, instead of having um, so I don't know how many of you, uh, whether in this class we studied the Dirichlet processes or not yet. If you have, then you'll be familiar with this notation here. Essentially, you have, um, you have a Dirichlet uh, process over some space, and then parameters uh, have a prior that's a Dirichlet, and a posterior that's dependent on the data. You can kind of write, rewrite this a little more explicitly by introducing this auxiliary variable psi, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, so now you, instead of having a Dirichlet that leads into, say, a multinomial or whatever, you have a Dirichlet process that leads into a Dirichlet that leads into the multinomial. So by introducing this extra layer, and these two are equivalent, and I won't go into the math, uh, so you don't need to know that, but by introducing this extra layer, you introduce an opportunity for parallelism by decoupling the Dirichlet process part of distribution from the, um, from the posterior part, which is basically the usually a multinomial in the case of the Richelieu process problems. So the idea again is to introduce, it's like introducing an intermediate variable so I can split the dependencies on above and below and do parallel uh, MCMC. Um, so I won't go into the theory of why this works, but I just want you to be aware that it is possible to rewrite distributions and it's kind of like uncollapsing them basically so that you can parallelize. Okay, uh, I'm gonna skip over this part and go on to the next one. So again, this is, uh, this is another technique that's been used recently, which is called embarrassingly parallel MCMC. It is kind of, a, the intuition's a little bit like sequential importance sampling, in that what we're gonna do is we're gonna bake up the posterior distribution and factorize it kind of smartly in a way that we can do parallelism. Uh, but unlike sequential importance sampling, there's no ordering the variables. This is actually a communication-free method that is kind of like, Think of it more as an improvement to the very first method I talk about, which is parallel chains. But instead of doing parallel chains, the weakness of parallel chains is that every chain has the full data. It's like doing parallel chains, but every chain only has a subset of data. And the trick that's used is what's called a sub-posterior, which is taking the, taking the product um, the product over the data and the prior. So you take the prior, the, 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 sorry, the posterior related term, I'm sorry, you take the evidence term, you split that over data samples. You also do the same to the prior. So how do you split a prior? Well, you just take one to the power of, uh, to the power of one over number of machines, right? Because if you have P machines, and I take this prior, which is to the one over P, and multiply it by itself P times, you get back the original prior. So that simple intuition allows you to then, okay, split the problem over multiple machines, and you just do the posterior inference on all the different machines. The tricky part is, okay, now I've got all these samples, what's the correct way to recombine them? So there is a wrong way to recombine. The wrong way to recombine is to uh, simply average all the, all the so-called sub-posteriors, right? I'm just gonna take a simple average over them. Uh, this results in, uh, let's see, let me got the graph correct here. I apologize, this is a bit hard to see. Um, but what it's showing here is that if you do a naive averaging, you get the green circles in, in both graphs, which is far away from the true, uh, the true uh, posterior, right? So what you do, want to, do not want to do is to naively recombine all of the work on each machine. Instead, you need to go to a certain type of uh, uh, non-parametric estimator, which essentially boils down to constructing another distribution and sampling from it. So you're basically putting another probability distribution on top to correct for the bias in recombining the sub-posteriors. It's complicated, so I'm not going to go into it, but I just want you to be, again, beware the intuition. You can split data, 
you can do the posterior inference on each machine, and you just need a special way of recombining. That's been the kind of the theme the whole class so far. If you are smart about how you schedule and recombine, you can get good parallel performance. And or rather, I should say it's necessary to be smart about it if you want to get good performance. Okay. Now here's the third part that I actually want to spend a little bit more time on, which is uh, parallel Gibbs sampling because it's so common, it's fairly easy to understand, and it's common enough that you probably should know about it because it's used a lot in practice. So um, first of all, I, can I take it that everyone here has uh, done Gibbs sampling earlier in the class? Perfect. Okay. So if you studied Gibbs sampling, chances are you've also studied. Uh, the Gibbs sampler for latent Dirichlet allocation or topic models, uh, which in its uh, most, uh, let's call it efficient single machine form, takes the form of what we call the collapse Gibbs sampler. The collapse Gibbs sampler uh, essentially rewrites the distributions as a uh, Dirichlet multinomial and then derives the inference, uh, derives the uh, sampling equations directly from there. So it has this particular closed form. Okay, so collapse Gibbs sampling is done because of Raoul or the Raoul Blackwell theorem. The more variables you integrate out, that's to say collapse out, the better your, the, the lower your variance is going to be when you're sampling, so it's going to converge faster theoretically. Uh, and this has nice properties in that it's empirically robust. Because of the size of uh, this uh, matrix B, and, uh, and because of the size of the uh, vector delta, uh, so, um, uh, and just, just to get the terminology right, B is the, what we call the uh, word topic matrix. It's the matrix of distributions over every topic. And delta is basically the topic vectors, right? So, um, or rather, should I say the sufficient statistics for the topic vectors? But I, I think I'll just gloss over those details in the interest of time. So the point is that minor errors in this, due to the fact that topic modeling tends to be done on very large document corpora, we're talking about billions of documents, maybe trillions of words, any small errors to the order of like plus one to 10 to these sufficient statistics is basically a, a drop in the ocean. So it tends to be empirically robust to errors here. And this empirically robust property was actually exploited to do the first um, parallel, uh, the first parallel uh, topic model sampler. And the way that parallelization works is that, okay, you first have the topic, uh, the topic sufficient statistics delta you have the uh, word topic sufficient statistics B. And then, okay, I'm just gonna split partition the document, and I'm going to literally make a copy of B on every machine. And then I'm gonna just let everyone do the Gibbs sampling. And what that means is that because everyone has a copy of B, everyone's copy of B is gonna look different due to the fact they're all doing Gibbs sampling, updating differently. But as I said, due to the very large number of tokens, words in typical topic modeling problems, the error in delta and B tends to be negligible anyway when you're doing this. So it turns out that this uh, naive parallelization where we don't even bother to synchronize the Bs correctly, or well, I should say that we tend to synchronize them after every few iterations, but the point is that during the process of a single iteration, they're all going out of sync. So, uh, and uh, that was actually what I just explained here have a central model, broadcast it, perform Gibbs sampling in parallel across the different machines, commit changes back, but in between this part here, all of these are allowed to be different, and that's why they have different colors. And then only here you reconcile them. Okay, so there's only one problem with this. Although empirically it works well, it actually isn't theoretically guaranteed to converge. In fact, you can actually prove it's not going to converge because uh, the ergodicity property of Markov chains is broken when you do this, right? But it's generally good enough if your data is big enough. You won't do this on a small data set. You're going to do this on a big data set, like I said. Uh, but there's a second, maybe, and more problematic issue, which is the fact that uh, the typical way of doing this commit changes back is bulk synchronous parallel. What this means is that you wait for so everyone sends to the server, the parameter server or key value store. You wait for it to finish doing its thing, and you send it all back out. In the meantime, all the workers are just twiddling their thumbs, doing nothing. Uh, and by the way, that time is not trivial. It, in some problems and some networks, it can actually be the case that the time taken for the round trip to the server is longer than the computation at each worker. So that's how you shoot yourself in the foot. You end up waiting for instructions longer than you actually do work. So 
how do, can you overlap the computation and communication for better efficiency? So here I'm just going to talk at a high level about the ideas as there won't be enough time to go through in detail. But essentially, what you need to, um, what you need to understand is that one way to deal with the problem, uh, and this is done by a paper called GraphLab, which was at CMU a couple of years ago, is to, instead of thinking about it as two matrices, why don't we look at the dependency structure between the topic, the dot topic vectors and the topic word uh, uh, vectors, right? And so you can actually draw a dependency graph. It's actually taking advantage of sparsity in the problem. Why is that so? If I have a topic about, uh, say, horror movies, it's going to contain a different set of words than a topic about comedy movies, right? You won't have slasher in a comedy movie unless it's a you know, horror comedy movie. So the fact is there is a certain structure in that entire problem that is not obvious at first glance. The fact that not every document exhibits every uh, word, and therefore you can, actually, uh, you can actually create a graph, and you can you essentially use this graph to schedule the Gibbs sampling operation such that they don't collide. I won't go into the details about it, but the point is that there is a structure that can be exploited. You're welcome to read the paper if you want to understand that a bit deeper. Okay, uh, in the original implementation of this, they actually uh, did an asynchronous communication in this paper. And the reason for that is that, well, since I'm guaranteeing that none of the computation is ever going to overlap, it's in a way kind of intuitively safer for me to allow the some to allow, uh, well, it's not just intuitively safer. If they don't overlap with each other, that means they don't need information from each other, and therefore there's no real need to communicate it. And so this is actually a model parallel strategy because it's taking into account the model structure. In fact, you can actually call it both data and model parallel, to be honest. Uh, of course, the big drawback here is that you need to convert the entire topic model problem into a graph. That initial setup cost may be non-trivial. Uh, in fact, it's probably non-trivial for a very large problem and impractical. So is there a better middle ground than this, right? Trying to turn it to whole graph seems excessive. So what else can we do? Well, this is actually another good idea here. So if we look at all of the, um, what we call the token indicators, the Zs in the model, right? Basically for every document, there's going to be one Z for every single, um, for every single, uh, I'm sorry, uh, forget what I just said, that, that's not what the point I was trying to make. Uh, ignore the Z for now, let's just understand that a matrix can be partitioned in a certain way such that the rows and columns don't overlap. So if you look at each matrix here, let's say you have a matrix that's three by three. I could pick one, one, two, two, three, three, and these are three parts of the matrix that don't overlap in rows and columns. If I shift everything right one step, I get uh, 1, 2, 2, 3, and 3, 1. I shift everything right again, I get this configuration. The point is that if I overlap all these three together, I've actually touched every part of the matrix, but in every, uh, in every step, none of the gray blocks overlap, but yet all the gray blocks over all the steps cover the whole matrix. So this is an important, intu what we call a scheduling intuition that allows us to, uh, sample the topic model in a very smart way that doesn't require you to use graphs, so it's very cheap to set up, doesn't require you to compute a graph, yet has all the nice properties of the graph lab, sample, of the graph lab LDA. And the way you do it is that, think about, say, the doc topic matrix on the left and the word topic matrix on the top. The cross product of these two defines you know, a space of variables, and then we're just going to sample those variables with a particular schedule in the first step, we give, say, work, worker one this one, we give worker two this, we give worker three this. Second step, we give worker one this, two here, three here, one, two, three here, and we get essentially, um, you know, super iterations and sub iterations, right? This is a two level iteration. And that strategy is basically all you need to get all the benefits of GraphLab LDA without computing a graph. So that's, that's the strategy. Um, there are also, uh, what we call various system optimizations here that they're a bit low level, so I won't go into them. Uh, but the key intuition is really that be smart about how you partition the problem and you can eliminate dependencies wherever you go and then you can get very good uh, performance even when you're doing it asynchronously. Okay, I'm gonna skip over these slides. Um, okay, so uh, this, this takes us to the uh, 
this is kind of the first part of the lecture. The second part will be shorter. I'll try to finish that in about 15 minutes. Uh, but what you need to know is that there are parallel algorithms for optimization at MCMC. They share a certain number of common themes. There are embarrassingly parallel algorithms that are generally not very good in practice because they don't communicate with each other. There uh, there is partitioning over data, stochasticity, like stochastic gradient descent. There's partitioning over model. There is scheduling over models, which is being smart about how you partition the work so that two workers don't update a correlated or the same parameter. And there's auxiliary variable techniques where it's like the reverse of collapsing or integration. You try to introduce more variables so you make the problem easier to parallelize. Um, so on to the second part. So here I'm going to talk a little bit about the actual software systems that are used to support these algorithms and some of the considerations that are taken when designing them. So um, we talked about the algorithmic and mathematical properties of algorithms. Now we're actually going to talk about the system's properties I've been hinting at, such as delay, uh, such as uh, the fact that different machines may be working at different speeds and you have to deal with asynchronous computation, things that uh, we usually don't like to think about as machine learning people, but it's starting to become relevant as we start to deal with larger problems. So the first intuition you need to know is that there's no such thing as an ideal distributed system. Uh, what do I mean by ideal? So an ideal system has basically instantaneous communication between different workers and every worker performs exactly the same. These two do not hold in practice. So first, networks are slow. And second, you, so what do I mean by slow? They're about 100,000 times slower than CPU to memory. Second, uh, you're probably doing this on like a shared cluster. So there's other people using the cluster and guess what? They're also clogging up the network. So not, the network's not just slow, it's unreliable. So you, Today, maybe one minute, you have 100 megabits. The next minute, you have one megabit. Right, this happens all the time on Amazon EC2, if any of you use that. So you need to be aware of this, that the network is not a reliable uh, factor at all. It may as well be a random property of the, of the system. Two, identical machines don't perform equally. Here's a simple example. You have one part of the uh, data center that's a little warmer than the others. So that decreases the performance, the, the say, the maximum clock speed of the CPU, right? Because they all have thermal limits on them. Or you may have a machine that's vibrating a bit due to a fan. That causes the platter-based hard drive to vibrate, slowing down the read access. So you can't even assume the machines are performing identically. Uh, in a big data center, there's going to be hot zones, cold zones, vibrating zones. The point is you cannot assume anything about the uh, condition of the system. And But the worst threat comes from other users. Someone ran a job on your system, some admin performed a software update, boom, your performance is all gone. So that's the reality you've got to operate it, and that's actually what happens at all the big, uh, say, companies that use ML. They have to engineer their systems to deal with these kinds of problems. And what that means is that you have a situation where you can spend maybe one-sixth of your time doing computation. That's the blue part. I'm sorry, this is a bit small. And the rest of the five-sixths of the time, it's waiting for things to happen because there's always some slow machine or some slow part of the network. So this is actually why you don't want to actually create systems like uh, Hadoop or Spark that rely on bulk synchronous parallel execution for ML. ML requires very frequent iteration. You wait, you die. It's that simple because there's got to be someone that's slow, someone that's not doing anything. Uh, and that's the reality of uh, how we ML people have to approach systems. Now, there, in summary, the, con the conditions that you need to pay attention to are like the bandwidth of the network, how much information you can push across it, the latency, the time it takes for communication to happen. And these are not constants. These are probability distributions because the real world is uncertain. And then you have data, how you partition the data and model across machines, how you schedule the computation, like who goes first, who goes last, who goes together and dealing with all the non-ideal systems behavior that just turns all of these distributions into something very high variance in some the worst cases. So um, let's do a little bit of graphical intuition here. If the general picture of an ML iterative convergent algorithm is to iterate over data, perform some updates, and commit that to a, a parameter matrix or some set of parameters, then uh, we can think of, uh, uh, I'm going to skip over these slides. Then we can think of data parallelism as, okay, I partition the data, every worker does an update, the update applies to the full parameter space. Model parallelism is different. The data goes to every machine, but every machine only updates some part of the model. And it doesn't have to be a row or column, it could be some unusual shape, depending on the scheduling system. 
right? So that's the graphical intuition behind data and model parallelism. Uh, stepping back a little bit, I want to make a quick comment. I bashed a bit on Hadoop just now. Uh, here's the reason why. In a typical Hadoop system, when you do an ML computation, every iteration is punct between iterations is punctuated by this barrier where Hadoop writes everything back to the Hadoop distributed file system. This is a terrible idea because you know how big mammal models are? They're like gigabytes in size. So if you try to write gigabytes back to a distributed file system, you're going to be waiting there for a while. So uh, for this reason, uh, that's why the folks at UC Berkeley came up with Spark that tried to keep as much of the state in memory as possible. So that fixed the, what I call the stupid bottleneck, which is writing things to disk where you don't have to. But uh, what Spark doesn't fix is that it's still a bulk synchronous parallel system, so it doesn't deal with all the issues of network communication, etc. That's not to say Spark is bad for big data. It works for big data because big data is not really iterative. It's a one-time pass computation. So it's, in a way, some of that is embarrassingly parallel. You send the computation out to every machine, you wait however many hours it takes and it comes back. Not true for machine learning. We iterate multiple times per second uh, for some of the most high-performance algorithms. We cannot afford to be waiting for things to happen. Okay, so that, um, and this is just a summary slide, you know, data parallelism to the left, model parallelism to the right. If there's one thing you need to take away from this section, just remember this diagram. Okay, and of course you have uh, situations where data and model are both big, and so you need to be smart about partitioning over the data and the model. Okay, and the way that's usually handled is to give every worker a piece of the model, a piece of the data, and some basically channel by which they can synchronize parameters, usually a parameter server or key value store. Here, usually a sophisticated scheduler is needed to make the decisions about what parts of data and model go to each worker. Okay. So now, I've talked about data and model parallelism like it's a super easy thing, but really, what does it actually take to do that? So there are some mathematical conditions that need to be met. Data parallelism, in general, is going to be okay when the data is IID, which is the case for almost all problems we deal with. Model parallelism, you cannot be naive about it. As we explored in the first part of the lecture, naive model parallelism uh, breaks down quickly when there's correlations, co -collis uh, parameter, uh, update collisions, all of those things. You need to try to get the update model parameters that are as independent as possible on different machines. Less correlation is better generally for model parallelism. And that requires basically a carefully designed schedule or a scheduler system that's reading the problem structure on the fly and performing the fine-grained scheduling op operations to each machine. So the intrinsic properties of ML programs that actually allow these types of data and model par parallelism to exist are the fact that it's error tolerant. I talked about that at the beginning of the lecture. There are structural dependencies that, you know, correlations that could even be uh, uh, dynamic in certain problems, right? For, some more, for, for the lasso type problems, it's stat the correlation is static because the data is static. But for, say, certain more complex graphical models, there may be correlations between different random variables inside the model. And then there's also a uh, very important non-uniform convergence. You don't need to spend the same amount of time on every part of the model. Just focus your effort and attention on the parts that are still moving very quickly so you get them to converge faster. Okay. So uh, I talked a little bit uh, in the first section about bulk synchronous parallel and async. Uh, and what, what do they really mean by that? Well, bulk synchronous parallel is the communication model used by Hadoop and Spark. Everyone does some work, barrier, everyone waits for everyone to talk to each other, does some work again. The different length arrows uh, illustrate the problem of BSP, that not all workers operate at the same speed. So, Every white gap here is a piece of wasted computation that you could have been using something. Async is the opposite. You can, everybody just runs as fast as possible, so there's no wasted computation. The only problem is what happens if some machine has a, like a hard drive failure, uh, and the machine hasn't crashed yet. Then you get this very long bar here, where it's taking a long, long time to read from the hard drive and not doing any useful work. So in a sense, you have a system that uh, has one machine that's really far, like far behind. So. The middle, so the kind of uh, middle ground between these two is a system that we call a still synchronous parallel that I showed a diagram a little earlier. It's kind of the best of both worlds of BSP and async. It's like on, it's like half, it's like the, let's call it the child of both BSP and async. You 
are allowed to be asynchronous up to a limit. You can go ahead faster and slower than other people. But if you are, as soon as you are faster than some number of iterations, let's call it S, here S is three, you're going to stop. You're going to, the schedule is going to tell you, stop, wait for the slowest guy to catch up. And this is very important because remember what I said about uneven performance in data centers? That uneven performance is a distribution. So it may be one machine today that's faster and another machine that's faster the next second because, you know, the temperature across the data center is changing, the vibrations are changing, or the, even the workload is changing. So this is a mechanism that actually allows the, what we call the transient stragglers, the workers that are slow due to like, it's just like a bad joke here, you're going homeless, but most people don't say homeless so long you get back on your feet, right? So let's say, let's say you're, you're down your luck for a little bit, but you know you can recover. So the system gives you time to recover, and then later on there'll be some other guy that's down having a problem. And that's why this property is so important for dealing with real-world systems. Having this buffer here to tolerate some amount of slowness and fastness is essential to keep everyone computing 99% of the time, and then where you really have to wait, you wait. Okay, there's improvements upon this protocol uh, that allow what we call uh, eager still synchronous parallel, which uh, uses, it's kind of like scheduling on the, uh, net, the local aero network itself. If you have spare bandwidth, you push out parameters faster. It's just a systems improvement that basically improves the uh, um, distribution of staleness. So standard SSP, tends to have a uniform distribution of staleness. If your staleness is S, then it's uniformly distributed between 1 to S, the, the kind of relative delay between machines. Eager SSP tries to get that distribution as close as possible to zero, uh, zero, zero delay. Um, there are some more results about uh, basically uh, stale synchronous parallel versus BSP and pure sync. In every case, uh, in every case, basically, stale synchronous parallel is better than async or BSP. So you don't need to use either one. The point is that you need to find a middle ground between both to tackle the properties of a real-world distributed system. Okay. I'm going to skip over this part as we actually talked about it quite a bit in our discussion of um, uh, Lasso earlier and coordinate descent and scheduling. So this is a bit, little bit repetitive with earlier. Uh, you heard about priority-based scheduling already from earlier. There's also block-based scheduling, which you actually saw in the topic model example, where you have this pattern of you know, moving blocks that eventually covers everything. That's also applicable to, that's also a concept that's applicable to coordinate descent or lasso, not just topic models. Okay, and the whole system that was created to do this is called, it's a paper called STRADS. I encourage you to read it if you want to see how this works in practice. Um, okay. Last uh, but not least, I'm going to say a few concluding remarks about the theory of real-world distributed ML systems. So uh, we want to make sure that these things are actually principled and that we have some guarantee that it's going to converge. But more importantly, we want to understand the reason why it converges and what factors both mathematical and systems influence the rate. So the first thing, uh, the first thing we'll talk about is uh, types of convergence guarantees, right? So uh, there are essentially several kinds uh, getting stronger and stronger. The first one's a regret or expectation or mean bound, basically. It's saying that, okay, uh, the, mean, the mean value of the parameters is going to converge. That's the weakest type of bound. A stronger one is a probabilistic bound, which is saying that, oh, I know the distribution as a whole is going to converge to a particular shape. So the first one's a statement about the mean. The second one's a statement about the distribution of the parameters. The third one is a statement about the variance of the parameters as well. Uh, and remember that, you know, parameters, the here when I say parameter, I'm talking about the parameter estimate that's generated by the distributed system. It's a probabilistic quantity because first of all, the algorithm is a, you know, has statistical properties. And secondly, the real world distributed system has also probability distributions over its latencies and other properties as well. So distributed analysis of ML algorithms actually considers both the distribution the, over the data and the distribution over the real world system as well. So that's kind of pretty cool in my opinion. Um, so I'm gonna skip over this comment. The, so the first uh, thing you need to know is that one of the first bounds that was developed for the uh, SSP type of system is what we call a regret bound that just basically proves it converges. But the, and this is equation, it's fairly simple as most bounds go. But the important thing is note the interrelation between uh, 
the mathematical properties, the Lipschitz constant, and the number of machines or the staleness. I'll be done in one minute. And then uh, the important intuition you want to take away about why it converges is that ESSP or SSP approximates a sequential ordering of the work. So you can actually do this a kind of a solo tail pattern here. And then what happens is that because some machines are running faster and slower, there's a bit of reordering here. But the point is that over the long run, this is basically equivalent to a sequential execution. And that's the reason why it converges. Um, there are other types of bounds that go a little further. I encourage you to read it, uh, not to read the stat equation too hard, but to understand where the number of parallel machines and where the system's attributes like delay and come into this. So you actually know how they, uh, why delay is a bad thing and why we need these types of systems. Okay, um, and I think with that, I will not talk too much about all of these theorems have the similar, similar property. Look out for the typical mathematical properties that you learn in other ML classes, but also look out for the systems properties. They're all pointed out, and that helps you understand uh, this world of theoretical analysis on these models. And with that, uh, that's the summary. We get to the summary. The real-world distributed systems are not ideal. We have several solutions to deal with this. Bounded asynchronous parallelism, like the still synchronous parallel model. Scheduling, like schedule model parallelism, that I do prioritization. I do, uh, you know, kind of teasing apart correlations so you don't update correlated variables together. There is a rich literature of theoretical analysis around it that proves it converges despite the real-world conditions like latency and delay and the variance around it. Okay, and that's the summary of it. All right, that's the end of the lecture. Thanks for allowing me to go a little over time. 